I'd like to call this meeting to order. Will the secretary please call the roll? Mrs. Becker? Mr. Carangelo? Here. Mrs. Chu? Here. Mr. Sismar? Here. Mrs. Gwas? Here. Mr. Hong? Here. Mrs. Reese? Here. Mr. Winston? Here. And President Lax? Here. We have a quorum. Please rise to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law was enacted to ensure the right to the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of public bodies in which any business affecting their interests is discussed and acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the East Brunswick Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof posted at the Board of Education offices. Written notice was also provided to the Sentinel, the Newark Star-Ledger, the Home News and Tribune, and the Municipal Clerk of East Brunswick. All Board of Education meetings, with the exception of executive session discussions, are videotaped for later broadcast. It is the policy of the Board of Education that videotape meetings are not edited for any purpose. Individuals who speak at the Board's public meetings should be aware of these videotaping rules. Dr. Waleski, we'll start with your report. Thank you, President Lax, and good evening, everyone. The art room in the boardroom this evening reflects the efforts of talented students at Hammersholt Middle School. Their teachers are Catherine Barrett, Lisa Gombas, and Leah Lefevre. Dr. Michael Gaskell is their principal. Today is the 100th day of the school year. Students in our elementary schools participated in various activities celebrating all that we have learned in the first 100 days of school. In the arts department, we have some exciting events this month. On Friday, February 4th, students from all eight elementary school buildings gathered at the JM Pack to listen to performances by the high school wind ensemble and chamber orchestra. This event allowed the students to hear performances from top ensembles in the district and to speak with the secondary level teachers and students about the benefits of continuing an instrumental music education throughout their time with East Brunswick Public Schools. On Monday, February 7th, choral students from all 11 school buildings gathered at the JM Pack to hear each other perform and discuss the benefits of continuing a choral education throughout their time with the East Brunswick Schools. In the evening, the various ensembles then performed again for their families at the JM Pack. It was wonderful to see students back up on stage performing during this beautiful celebration for the love of singing. On Tuesday evening, the high school orchestra held its annual mid-winter family concert. This year, the theme of the concert was an evening at the opera. The ensemble performed a variety of opera favorites, and two of the pieces were accompanied by EBHS school counselor, Danielle Balacci. Danielle is a trained opera singer who has performed all over the world before beginning her current counselor position in East Brunswick. And here is a short clip of this amazing performance. speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. 
Irwin School held its annual environmental convention this month. At this event, students shared their knowledge about pressing environmental concerns, efforts at recycling green energy, and companies reducing their carbon footprint. The second grade team at Central has a wonderful and ongoing relationship with the East Brunswick Senior Center. Throughout the year, our students send greetings to seniors who are always grateful to receive personal notes and drawings. Students in our Early Learning Academy preschool program have been investigating buildings for the past month as part of the creative curriculum studies. They discuss various buildings that they see in the community and incorporated math and number concepts using blocks, recycled boxes, and other classroom materials. The students had fun celebrating Chinese New Year and Valentine's Day with classroom activities. Our preschool students also had a visit from a Hammerschold student as part of the Middles to Little program. The student read to the ELA students and they enjoyed asking questions and learning about the book together. The ELA preschool students are looking forward to exploring all aspects of music in their next creative curriculum study. And we have planned some special events including visits from the Hammerschold Orchestra, Hammerschold Chorus, and from parent musicians. In sports, which is always fun to talk about, boys winter track team is the Central Jersey sectional state champion. <laughs> Ariana McSweeney is the pole vault sectional champion at an amazing 10 feet. And we have I believe in the audience, Chris Sorreo set a U.S. New Jersey County and school record at the sectional meet running 7.29 in the 55 meter hurdles with a first place finish. Chris also placed first in the 55 meter dash and set a new school record of 6.46. Chris, would you stand up? Congratulations. Varsity cheerleading placed first at the St. John Vianney High School Jane A. Schalkowski Legacy Cheer Competition, and Varsity Cheerleading also placed first at the Impact Cheer and Dance Competition. Congratulations to our January High School Athletes of the Month. Students were selected for this honor by the coaching staff based on the performance demonstration of leadership, effort and practice, and as always, modeling exceptional character. Highlighting one of our successful programs, the goal of our East Brunswick Flex program is to create an environment focused on the social, emotional, and academic needs of our 9th through 12th grade students. Through a small environment, counseling support, and differentiated school hours, our students are able to achieve academic and social success. It is our goal to equip our students with the skills they need for a bright and prosperous future. Historically, the Flex program was run after school hours at Churchill Junior High School. And starting in the 2021-22 school year, the FLEX program was moved full-time to East Brunswick High School. This decision allows greater access to staffing resources, including a nurse, school security officer, school counselors, case managers, and administration. The change in time provides an opportunity for the wellness block, which all students develop skills they need to be successful. The program also focuses on job skill development and ensures students are college or career ready. Access to courses outside of FLEX also present, prevents I'm sorry, presents opportunities for authentic transitions back to East Brunswick High School and increases course offerings that students can participate in. Students can also engage in social activities such as clubs and sports. Moving on, the high school junior high school junior high school drama club presents Alice in Wonderland on Thursday, February 24th and Friday, February 25th. Both performances begin at 7 p.m. in the Churchill cafeteria. Tickets can be purchased at EJ, ejhs.booktix, that's B-O-O-K-T-I-X, dot com. Registration for kindergarten is now open for the 2022-2023 school year. Children who will be five years of age on or before October 31st, 2022, are eligible for our full-day kindergarten program for the 2022-2023 school year. School year. Please visit ebnet.org slash register for registration information. All required forms can be found on the website. 
To assist us in planning for the upcoming school year, please register by April 30th, 2022. The East Brunswick Education Foundation Partners in Excellence Dinner will be held on Thursday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, not Thursday, <laughs> April 5th at the Pines Manor in Edison. I'm going to blame all this on the mask, by the way. The East Brunswick Education Foundation trustees will honor Dr. Trudy Atkins, Dr. Anna Braun, Lisa Citron, and David Lonsky, Esquire. In addition, the EBEF will be celebrating the Alumni Hall of Fame induction of Dr. Scott Gottlieb, former head of the FDA, and Olympian Sam Mattis. For ticket information, please visit ebef.org. And just a reminder, schools will be closed on Monday, February 21st, in honor of President's Day. Thank you for your patience in that very long report. Thank you for stealing my um, spaciness. And so I'm the one that had the root canal today, not you. But you know, I'm, I'm, blaming, let, I'm blaming the I'll mask. You have the mask. I'm blaming That's the mask. That's fine. That's fine. We have a couple of reports. Do you want to kick it off with our energy savings uh, yes. improvement program? Because you're not wearing a BB mask. Good evening. So a couple of years back, uh, the board approved uh, a program that we entered into, the Energy Savings Improvement Program. Um, let me give you a little bit of background on what that program is, if the remote works. There we go. And I'm sorry, this does not come with any opera singing, so I apologize <laughs> in advance. Uh, the ESA program, it's a state-operated, uh, uh, state-approved funding mechanism. Uh, the way this works is that um, there are, uh, there's a bonding process uh, for this um, that is fully paid for by the savings that are achieved by the improvements that are made throughout the district the value of the improvements are guaranteed. So we don't, there's no risk to the district uh, that we might not achieve the savings um, and ultimately um, uh, incur a cost. So uh, it, this is a good bet. This has been a good bet. Um, the projects are paid out of the energy and operational savings. Uh, it does not impact the taxes uh, that go to the schools. It doesn't impact the operating budget. Uh, and one of the uh, big positives is that this program reduces the carbon footprint of the district. Whoa. Now it's got a mind of its own. Karen, can you back this up, please? More. Uh, okay, now we're going to go forward one. There we go. So the energy saving uh, conservation measures that were undertaken involve uh, things such as LED lighting throughout our facilities, um, vendor occupancy controls, uh, dealing with uh, vending machines to any vending machines that are in the district, reducing their, their uh, energy consumption, uh, motor replacements and variable frequency drives, None of this really sounds very exciting, but ultimately it has a large impact. Uh, building management systems uh, that control our uh, heating and air conditioning uh, systems, our building envelope improvements, which would be weatherizing um, the uh, uh, windows and doors and so forth to eliminate any drafts, uh, air destratification, high efficiency transformers, and solar power. Uh, this is uh, a chart that uh, lists the energy conservation measures by building uh, so that we can see uh, exactly which buildings received uh, which uh, efficiency measures. Uh, where buildings are not checked off uh, for certain things, that's because there weren't such improvements that would have been applicable within those facilities. And I'm not going to go through building by building. Uh, this information will be posted on the website. And the board, you have a copy of the, uh, the presentation. 
So in terms of cost, the value of the project was almost $8.9 million. The energy and operational savings under the program amount to about 874. This is the annual energy uh, savings, about $874,000. The cash flow average after payments made against the system are uh, roughly $200,000. That's to the positive for the district. And the projected savings over the term of this pro over the term of the, the uh, loan associated with this is over $14 million. So that's certainly nothing to uh, shy away from. That's a very, uh, very good result. And then as we look at that broken down into a pie chart, before the improvements were made, nearly uh, two-thirds of the costs that we uh, were incurring were going toward energy costs. Uh, and of the costs incurred, one-fourth was going to maintenance. As a result of the improvements, those energy costs are significantly reduced, the maintenance costs are reduced, and the savings that we uh, are receiving as a result are going to pay for the improvements. So um, that's exactly where we wanted to see this go. In terms of environmental impact, the electrical savings will be approximately 5.5 kilowatt, 5.5 million kilowatt hours. The gas savings will be over 96,000 therms. The greenhouse gas emissions will be reduced by almost 3,400 metric tons. Uh, that's the equivalent of 717 vehicles being taken off the road and the equivalent of also 3,216 acres of trees being planted. Uh, so very good impact on the environment. And there's another aspect um, of the project that uh, uh, finished up just a couple of months back, and that is uh, our solar energy uh, program. Uh, we have five facilities that um, have been fitted with, and this remote is not working again, that have been fitted with uh, solar energy panels. Production of solar energy began in October. Our five locations are Central, Churchill, Lawrence Brook Memorial, and the Sport Operations Facility. Now, I'm sure someone might ask, well, why didn't we do other locations? The roofs have to be in optimal condition in order for us to be able to put solar on top of them. If the roofs are, you know, are not um, at the beginning of their useful lives, then the issue becomes one where the solar panels would have to be removed, and that incurs cost, and it's just not feasible to do. But in these locations, we were good to go. Uh, and so as a result, since October, the energy production to date is over 514 megawatt hours. That's as of this afternoon when I took those uh, the readings off of the, uh, the um, sites. Our CO2 emissions have been reduced to date by over 796,000 pounds, and the equivalent of trees planted during this period of time is over 6,000. Now, interesting note at the bottom, that in 2020, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, the average home used 893 kilowatt hours per month. 514 megawatt hours powers approximately 576 homes in a one month period. So that's really important. We have an addition to our website on the main page. Uh, you'll notice uh, when you go to the main page at ebnet.org, the tile at the top left is green energy update. And by clicking on that, that will take take you to the subpage, provides a little bit of information regarding uh, when we went live with solar, um, and provides links to each of the five locations where solar has been installed. And those links would then take us to a subpage, which provides real-time data regarding uh, the current power being generated, uh, the year-to-date or lifetime uh, energy that's been produced, um, and then these charts. This chart provides a day-by-day -day during the month, so you can see 
uh, within the month of February where the ups and downs have been in terms of energy generation. Uh, in, the, uh, in the lower right-hand side is information regarding the CO2 and uh, CO2 uh, emissions reduction and also um, the uh, estimated trees that have been uh, planted as a result. And then there are other adjustments that can be made in terms of looking at this on a month-to-month -month basis and then um, over a period of time uh, looking at the historical information. And this is available for each of the sites and it is now live uh, on our website. And that concludes the report. This was a good move for the district. Uh, doing the right thing, not only for the environment, um, but for the community as well. Any questions? Do we have any questions from the board? Just two. Okay. Um, and no question, just a comment that um, this is, I think, a project that took a number of years. And, you know, the project makes a lot of sense, saves money, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't cost the district anything, but it takes effort. So just want to thank you and, and your team for taking the initiative and the leadership to make this happen for the, uh, for the school district. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Hong. Yes, uh, you, uh, one of the slides says, over the term, the project saving is more than $14 million. And the next two uh, slides is, uh, one is the environmental impact. This is every year or over the term for this page. Yes. Uh, this is, this would be, um, I Just believe, for one year or over the term. I believe that, I believe that's an annual impact, but I'll clarify that for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. All righty. Uh, next. So next up. Uh, are our presentations regarding the school budget. We began these presentations at the last board meeting. Uh, we are deep into the budget process for the 2022-2023 school year. Uh, so continuing on, our first, our first presentation, these buttons just are not working well tonight. First presentation is uh, from facilities management. Gary. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Jerry Skank, and I'm happy to present the uh, Facilities Management Department's budget. Uh, next slide. Am I controlling them quickly? Okay. Next slide, please. So this is what our budget advocates for, for buildings and properties that are environmentally comfortable, well-maintained, safe, and efficient. It also um, provides for us to comply with uh, various uh, federal and state laws uh, the township laws and also uh, board policies and regulations. The next, our, our budget is broken down into four main components and we'll talk about what, uh, what those components are comprised of in these next few slides. The first one is building and systems maintenance and repairs, which encompasses electrical, concrete, doors, general maintenance, replacing ceiling tile, uh, painting and other things. Next slide. The next major component is uh, environmental services such as ADHERA. ADHERA stands for the Asbestos Hazardous uh, Emergency Response Act, Response Act and that, uh, that governs how asbestos is treated and managed in, in all of our older facilities. Uh, indoor air quality. NOx testing, which is just combustion testing for our high efficiency uh, boilers that, we, that the uh, district operates to make sure they're not um, uh, producing too many pollutants and they're burning efficiently. Uh, the Right to Know Act. Custodial services is another huge part, uh, and that's cleaning and uh, trash removal. Next slide, please. And then the last component is uh, the care and upkeep of grounds, uh, and that uh, encompasses all of our athletic and sports fields to include natural and turf, um, 
courtyards, irrigation systems, landscaping, mulch beds, playgrounds, and snow removal, snow clearing. The next slide here is just uh, you know, a pie chart of how our budget is broken out uh, and the percentages each one of those major components uh, actually takes up. So you can see uh, that custodial and um, uh, custodial and trash, uh, trash removal you know, takes up a large percentage of our budget, almost 65%. Uh, the next is building systems maintenance, uh, which is at 18%. Running closely behind that is the care and upkeep of grounds. Um, and uh, one, one area that I want to point out is the HVAC furnace burner replacements and various equipment costs. So this, even though this is 2%, this is, uh, uh, what we did was analyze, uh, take some historical numbers and analyze uh, major components that we uh, project will either fail or need to be replaced, uh, like circulation pumps, um, your variable frequency drive motors, and, and uh, HVAC, other HVAC components. And uh, that's what that's budgeted for. Okay. Now the next two things, like any other department, uh, we've got some significant shortfalls uh, and helping to keep our, our facilities um, uh, in top-notch top -notch condition. These are some of the things that, um, that we don't have enough resources to fund right now. So uh, one of those is, uh, is, is roofing. But the district is, and the board has been very supportive uh, over the recent years, uh, replacing roofing systems. It's not like we haven't done anything. So for one, um, the pie chart is broken out into each one of our facilities. At, but what you won't see there is Churchill uh, Junior High School. That, that roofing uh, project was done with a huge HVAC project. You won't see Lawrence Brook on there. That roof was replaced uh, just last year in, uh, in conjunction with the, the solar uh, improvement project that Mr. Juliana had referenced. Uh, also, Frost and Warnsdorfer schools. So those are four, uh, four facilities, and Churchill being the largest, uh, where we've taken steps to try to, uh, try to stay up with the aging, with our aging infrastructure. But as you can see, you know, there's a significant shortfall in maintenance and roof and replacements that we still have at other facilities. Next slide. And another part of that, our infrastructure, is our pavements uh, and curbing. So parking lots. Uh, and everything, and this is one thing that we have not been able to chip away at. Um, the resources just have not been available. Um, so you can see how uh, each one of our facilities is broken down, and um, whether it's a full replacement, uh, or whether it's periodic maintenance, uh, crack, um, filling cracks, uh, and replacing curbs, this is, what, um, this is what's required uh, for our facilities. So with that, um, that was really, Quick, down and dirty. Are there any questions that I can uh, that I can answer? Thank you for um, that report. In terms of the paving and curbing needs, um, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, but I'll ask it anyway. So, the township always sets aside money to um, replace certain sidewalks and to do paving, and I know some of it is funded and earmarked by the county and the state. But um, within their budget, their operating budget, if they have funds for um, paving and curbing, would, have we explored doing things, I don't know if it would be a partnership, not necessarily a shared service, but working in conjunction with them to yes. possibly get a better rate and or get all of it done at the same time. A absolutely, um, and a perfect example of that, um, uh, the district, where the district benefited from was when the, um, when the county uh, repaved um, Cranberry. Cranberry Road. Uh, so we partnered with them, we reached out to them, uh, let them know that since, since the, the high school entr main entrance is off there and it was in bad condition, we uh, partnered with them in what's called an interlocal uh, agreement and we had them repave uh, and also put in new, um, new traffic control lights. So that was one way that we use, um, that we have used uh, partnering services and everything that you're talking about to help improve our properties as well. You know, Thank so. you, I was hoping you were gonna use Cranberry Road as your example. <laughs> <laughs> that was Thank a major you. success. I was pretty happy about Thank that Thank you, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, it, it's also as you drive around town, um, so many of the roads are in bad shape, particularly the, the, the alarming number of potholes that have yes. developed. 
and of course it's it's directly a correlation to the amount of traffic over yes. any given road so of course the roads leading to our schools are heavily trafficked and it seems like so many of them are in some of the worst shape mm -hmm. so um, glad to hear that we work hand in hand with the town always glad to hear that we work hand in hand with the township and if I can um, if I can add with that um, I always reach out to uh, to the township and uh, the county to see what paving projects that they have on their agenda mm -hmm. And then see if we have if there's any needs, any district needs that we have, so we can also kind of engage in, in that and, um, and and get some work done uh, for a lot cheaper, a lot cheaper cost. And one more, I'm sorry, and then this will, this will be it to to piggyback on all of that. At the same time, when the township is going to be doing any kind of a major, whether it's a sewer replacement or curb replacement or anything that might hinder access. To any of our buildings uh, even if it's during the summer I mean we know that our buildings are used for a lot of things during the summer mm -hmm. um, I hope I would like to hear that they've always been very good about giving us a heads up mm -hmm. so that we can plan accordingly even if we have to reroute buses or yes. um, they have um, there's been some major projects that the uh, the township and county has undertaken uh, one that comes to mind is um, the gas line replacements um, in um, off of Ennis Road, the mm -hmm. memorial. So typically, a couple months before they start, uh, they'll send us a, a letter, say, you know, just uh, letting us know uh, what's going to be going Great. on, and then I can coordinate with that project manager about school hours, uh, entrances, and then we can kind of we can kind of work things out so that they can progress their project. Um, and still provide that service to the community without affecting the district. Terrific. Yeah, so, so that communication is happening. All good answers. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Any, yes, anyone sir. else? Just over here. So uh, there is a very significant roof budget shortage. So for high school only, it's almost $6.4 million. So next slide. Are you, you're referencing the paving chart? No, the, the, roofing. the roofing. roofing. The roof? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, that's the one. So without this six point four million dollars, yes. can you still keep high school roofing from leaking? Or without this one, you still can keep our students from leaking problem? Mm -hmm. Then what's this six point four million dollars? Would you please tell us more about this uh, roof uh, budget shortage? So I believe he was, he's, he was referencing Central. No, I'm no, referencing the high school. The high, oh, the high school. High school. Um, uh, to be honest, that falls under our general maintenance uh, and building system maintenance um, uh, part of our budget, which is back on the uh, back on the first pie chart. And uh, as uh, as leaks are identified in our system, whether they come from a roof drain uh, or a some sort of penetration, uh, then we contract those services out um, and uh, to have that area addressed but it has not been replaced uh, or maintenance or repairs have not been replaced to, for as far as uh, an entire area, you know, uh, whether it's H Hall, F Hall. They're not in big sections, but they're in, they're in portions to try to address the, address the leak, keep the building um, sound um, until, we can, until we can find, you know, I can work with the, the business office and we can find a, a way to address those problems. But that, that maintenance uh, and roof repairs falls under our, our building maintenance. If I if I can for a moment, um, so I, I think I hear the the underlying question that that you have on your mind. Um, the roofs aren't leaking, so we don't have a problem where the water where where we've got rainwater coming in. When those a areas are identified where there is a problem, they get repaired. These numbers largely represent replacements that need to be done wholesale replacements, which are much larger than what we can uh, sustain at this point in time. <coughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good job. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Mr. Electronica is next. Yes. Come on down. Mm -hmm. Wants to control his own feet. Yeah, I wonder if the technology is going to work for our chief <laughs> information officer. That, that's why I brought my own. Oh. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, before I can begin to talk about the IT budget, 
I really need to express my appreciation towards the board, Dr. Valeski, Mr. Giuliano, um, for understanding how critical technology is in our environment <clears throat> and for how important it is to have the appropriate Thank funding. You. It really allows us to achieve our technology goals as well as sustain the environment that we have. <clears throat> uh, I also want to give a shout out to the Information Technology Department who go above and beyond my expectations time and time again um, and allow us to keep our department running efficiently. Since the start of the pandemic, they've gone from supporting a couple of thousand staff members to over 10,000, 15,000 staff students and parents now. Uh, we have a dedicated help desk queue just for parent support. Um, and this has all been done without increasing the number of employees that we have in IT. They are truly a dedicated group of hardworking individuals, so thank you. Um, now I'd like to give you an overview of what the IT budget covers and what we maintain. So the IT budget supports and maintains technology across the district. We support and manage approximately 4,000 one-to-one Windows laptops which are for students grades 8 through 12, as well as instructional technology, I mean instructional faculty. Approximately 7,000 one-to-one Chromebooks that are for students in grades K through 7, as well as instructional aids. About 2,000 PCs and Macs, which are used for stationary computer labs. And if you're counting, that's about 13,000 endpoints that, that we manage. We have over 800 wireless access points that give us end-to-end -end, uh, wireless internet coverage <clears throat> throughout all of our buildings in the district. We have interactive display technology, such as the board that you see here, um, and smart boards in almost every classroom. The classrooms that don't have interactive um, displays have LCD projectors or televisions. And we have two data centers that have redundancy for all of our major systems, just in case a disaster happens. Not that that ever happens. Uh, we have over 10,000 manage user accounts, and we also have the ability to see when and where every account is accessed from. So this gives us tremendous insight into cybersecurity threats, um, such as hacked accounts, and lets us be proactive in protecting our uh, faculty and student accounts. Almost all of our instructional and business systems are accessible from anywhere with an internet connection. We like to follow the philosophy of leading edge, not bleeding edge. We do our due diligence to make sure we're being innovative while still maintaining safety, security, and quality standards. And so far, the remote is working for me. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, the IT budget supports technology in all operational areas, and it includes our 10 gigabyte internet service, our internet filtering and network monitoring systems, uh, business systems such as PaperCut, and our elect electronic uh, faxing system, which are allowing us to reduce paper consumption uh, largely and helps us to monitor printing trends so that we can try to find solutions for high print volume users. <clears throat> it covers our student information system, our transportation systems, our finance and human resource systems, uh, and it also covers our Office 365 subscription, which includes management of our email, network, endpoints, and overall our data. Uh, it supports our cybersecurity awareness and phishing attack simulator system. This helps uh, staff members keep them alert and aware of cybersecurity risks in an ongoing basis. It's not working for you, is it? No, my brain's not working. <laughs> uh, the budget also covers software services and licenses uh, for instructional applications such as Discovery Education, Brain Pop, Star Math, and iReady, uh, Naviance, which is our college and career readiness system, IEP Direct, which provides support for special education services and uh, services that help us to monitor social media threats. Uh, covers systems for our curriculum and lesson planning, our learning management systems at Churchill and the high school, uh, staff evaluation and professional development systems, and tools to help us monitor and analyze student data. Here, you can see the graphical representation of how the spending is broken down categorically. Uh, the largest piece of the budgetary pie is for computer equipment and supplies, including infrastructure, things that are basically on a uh, replacement cycle. Having this dedicated equipment budget allows us to keep hardware within acceptable age limits, 
And the second largest bucket that you see is what we spend for enterprise systems that support the entire district. And that is followed closely by uh, systems and resources that are directly related to instruction. That is it. I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Oh, I'm sorry. Mrs. Becker. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I know when people think of um, IT or anything, but for the school district, they think of hardware and software. And um, forget that, not forget, but not think about the fact that if the infrastructure isn't in place, it doesn't matter what hardware and software you have. So I, I want to compliment you and um, Dr. Valesky and, and Bernie uh, and your, your staff on, on the continued foresight to make sure that we have the proper infrastructure in place and to spend the money where we need to to support all these things. Speaking of support, my real question was, uh, I know during the pandemic we really upped the uh, support methodologies and amount of personnel we had available for staff and students because of the nature of, of having to be remote for, some, for so long. Um, we continue to offer that level of support available to our uh, staff and students, regardless of whether we're in person or not, because I think we saw that it made a, a tremendous difference in always having that help available. So if you could just speak to the support we provide or will be providing going forward. Well, you know, initially our one-to-one -one was for <laughs> our upper grades. I'm um, sorry? <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> getting over COVID. Well, not just, I'm perfectly healthy right now. No, it's uh, not. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm, I'm but, just, you know, I'm hard of hearing. Like the, our, our, the initial, um, the initial one to one program was, was really for grades <laughs> eight through 12. But with the pandemic, that you know, meant devices really going home to everyone. Um, and even now that we're back to in person, you know, almost all of our kids bring devices home or they keep their devices home nightly. So they're doing their homework, um, you know, and, it, and it's tough, especially when you have parents that don't do this for a living. You know, it's funny during times when you have kids that are at home, you'll have one parent, one mom, one aunt that calls in and she has five or six kids at home. And, um, you know, Doreen and Flo over here answer a lot of those calls, and you can hear the frustration and the, the terror in the parents' voices. So, you know, having... Doreen, Doreen is a saint. <laughs> you know, having someone that's very calm and, you know, patient, willing to, to step them through what needs to be done has really made a huge impact, and it's something that we'd like to continue to, to offer to our families. Okay, thank you. Actually, I wanted to follow up. Oh, give me one second. Because the question I was going to ask, you mentioned the parent support, that we now have a dedicated line. Is that correct? Dedicated for just the parent support? For uh... Yep. So uh, parents can get support by emailing parentsupport at ebnet.org. And uh, we do publicize that on our website. Um, and yeah, we... And that's something going forward we're going to hang on to as long as... As long as kids have it. devices at home, I don't okay. see how we could possibly do away with that. And you do get a lot. <laughs> so you do get a lot. Okay. It's hard. Usually the, we go to the kids to learn how to use technology, so. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. I, I know um, Lee Wu had a question. Susanna. And then, Susanna. Do you want to let Susanna go first? He's a gentleman. He's a true gentleman. <laughs> Thank you. It's a follow-on, actually, to, um, to what we were just discussing. And I thought I heard you say, you did all this without an increase in staff. Did I, did I hear that correctly? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? that? That the increase in support was accomplished without an increase in staff. That is correct. And, and I, I really want to highlight that because I, I don't know how you did it, but it's amazing because if you think, I, I'm just thinking about the number of calls that you folks had to be fielding during this time and the amount of workload that went up, and you managed to do this without an increase in staff. I would say that's an incredible um, accomplishment, keeping all these systems running and everybody getting the support that, you know, that they needed to get. Um, a, 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 a separate question, it's actually on an agenda item for later this evening, this technology coverage fund. 
So I recall from when I was on technology committee, or no, it was the finance committee, when we were talking about going to one-to-one -one devices, this is pre-COVID, and one of the concerns that the committee had was, um, you know, if, if somebody takes home the device and it breaks, and this technology coverage fund, it looks like it's really going well. It doesn't look like there's a lot of breakdowns that's taking cost away. So I, I don't know if you're familiar with the report I'm looking at, but this is showing the income for insurance premiums, less the expenditures. So I guess my question is, we're, it sounds like we're not seeing a lot of breakdowns of like people who are taking devices, breaking, and then needing to use the insurance. Am I reading that report correctly? So I, I think with the report, it's showing the income that, that has come in, but I don't think it's showing um, the reimbursement. So when we make purchases for uh, parts or even new devices, I'm not sure if it's showing. Uh, do you know, Mr. Giuliano? I'm it shows what's been report, reimbursed into the but account. I will get back to you on that, Mrs. Chu. Yeah, so I was, it, was a, it was a concern of ours, and offering this insurance program, uh, I think, was a, was a great idea to protect parents in the event something breaks and they're responsible for the repair. And so I was curious to see how that was working out and, you know, seeing if the fund was balancing out. So look, that's something we can follow up. You can follow up on when you have the information. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, the first year is uh, we're really going to kind of see where everything lies and if we need to make adjustments, we can. But one thing that's been really helpful is, you know, once again, the, the talented support staff that we have, um, they're all certified, they're all able to do repairs on the Chromebooks, on the Lenovo laptops, which helps us, you know, keep those overall costs down. Nick, if you could just, in follow up to Mrs. Chu's question, you, your return of devices when something doesn't work back to families and getting them operational again has been really quick. Anecdotally, we've talked and not many people go without a device for very long. Either you, you provide a substitute device or you repair the device. And so why don't you, could you just talk to that for a second about how quickly you return yeah, the so service? The model at the high school has been really, um, really excellent. They have the Genius Bar. Or well, it's not technically called the Genius Bar because that would be copyright infringement. But they have a technology center that's staffed by um, teachers as a duty and also one of our technicians. And in Churchill and Hammerschild also, we do have set hours where the students can come. And what we usually do, if it's not something that can be fixed instantly, we just swap out the device right. with another device. And that was one of the things that led us to try to self-insure because with the third-party insurance, we couldn't really swap those devices. If we gave them a new one, you would have to change everything with the insurance. By, by us doing it ourselves, we manage that ourselves and it's a lot more efficient. It's able to allow us to do that a lot uh, quicker. And if I may, just I pulled the report just to take a look at, uh, at what you were referring to. So um, the thing to keep in mind is that there was a um, one open enrollment period for uh, purchasing the insurance coverage. So that ended. So the funds came in, but as the months go by, there'll be charges uh, that will be drawn from that. So the costs are being uh, directly uh, assessed against the fund. Uh, so far, so good, but we've still got half a year to go through, so. Okay, so, good. <coughs> thank you. Okay. so Nick, uh, thank you very much for the, the beautiful uh, budget. So I realize that uh, your budget is $30,000 for the security. So we have more than 13,000 devices. We have more than 10,000 accounts. We have all the, more than I mean, 800 uh, access points. So for this security budget, is this $30,000 enough to provide you with the, to purchase the security tools or software? So I want to know more about it. Uh, I mean, as of right now, that's uh, what we feel is sufficient. We are taking advantage of some various free resources um, that, that the state offers. Um, They'll do outside penetration testing and vulnerability testing to help, you know, see if there are places where maybe we didn't, you know, know about this or that. It's, um, you know, there, there are a lot of great resources for school districts. But as time progresses, we always try to look at what we can do. Uh, we work really closely with a lot of the other school districts to, you know, kind of keep each other informed. You know, especially last year, I know a few school districts got hit really hard, uh, Hillsborough especially. So 
if there's something that we really feel is needed, it, it gets put in as a budget request without a doubt. Okay, uh, and, and I didn't uh, find out the, the data storage budget, so it's under which category. So uh, uh, apparently we have put a lot of huge amount of uh, data for this, for a small district like this size. So where's the budget for the data storage and the data security? So the data storage falls underneath our Office 365 agreement. Okay. Yeah, and, and then the pricing that we pay as a school district is like pennies on the dollar for what a big business would, would spend. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Reese? Okay. Uh, two things. One, I had a similar question to Susanna. I was just curious about the, the students and the care of the, of the Chromebooks and the things like that. And the other was just a compliment with the distribution of the laptops at the beginning of the pandemic when you had to give out all those laptops and a lot of districts didn't weren't able to get them out in time and we thank you for what you did. I remember being at uh, one of those buildings getting the laptops, things ran smoothly, it was very well run, and there was no confusion um, and so it made, I think it made a lot of difference for folks uh, why uh, online works so well based on what you and your staff did on Dr. Dwesk in the administration, so thank you for that. Well, thank you. I have to give a lot of the credit to Clifford Raymond, our, our desktop support manager, and uh, especially when we had to shift a couple of times to give out an extra 2,000 Chromebooks for our preschoolers and first graders. You know, I would call Cliff and say, Cliff, guess what we have to do by Monday? <laughs> and, you know, luckily he's always, he's a lot calmer than I am, and, you know, he pulls together his staff, and, and the staff really does uh, drop everything, and they work great as a team. So thank you for acknowledging that. Mr. Wentz, I think, is the question. Hi, Mr. Tronic. This was, once again, a great presentation. It was my favorite last year, and it continues to, uh, to uh, get gold stars. My, my question expands on uh, a question that was asked by one of my colleagues and regarding the 30,000 security, but really broadening that question. Uh, I know a breakdown in what you do could bring this district to its knees. And whenever I look at a technology budget, whether it be here or some of the companies that I work with, uh, I'm always concerned about what you're not asking for because if it, ha if it does, whatever that is, does happen, we're not ready or we didn't put it on our budget. I'd rather hear about it now proactively than to have you back in here reactively on how to fix it. Does any of that resonate with what's on this piece of paper? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, there are a few services in particular, and some of the security budget is bundled in with the Office 365, so it's not necessarily into that, into that security cost. Um, you know, but on, on our network side, um, our, our, senior net, uh, net, our senior manager of network support, Joe Neshi, is excellent at what he does. Uh, him and Ken Swoboda really do an excellent job of keeping things secure. When we had our small breach last year, we didn't lose any, um, you know, we didn't have to shut down school and the impact to, I think it was less than 10% of the systems um, had to be uh, remediated. But, you know, once again, if there is anything that we feel we need, we, we absolutely either reanalyze what we're currently paying for and seeing, you know, maybe we're not getting value out of this, we can cancel this and put this towards um, you know, a, a better product, but if there's something that we need, we definitely put it in as a budget request. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, uh, I love your staff because I did hear an audible noise when I asked that question, so I know there's been a conversation somewhere in some room somewhere uh, relative to that. I'd like to request to see that list of items at some point, uh, just for, for no other purpose than to know that this is something that you believe uh, would make things better. Yeah, I, I can reach out to you and we can follow up I appreciate it. with Thank that you. information. Just if I, if I may, I want to follow up on a couple of things. So to clarify, the section on the pie chart that refers to security, it's not IT security. It refers to school security. So systems related to school security that the IT budget manages. So, for example, a 911 inform system is one. Um, with regard to what Mr. Electronica was saying a few minutes ago, what's encompassed within the Office 365, and maybe this may give you a little more comfort, but that system alone 
is about $100,000 per year. It's not a $30,000 expenditure. Uh, and then there were multiple other aspects as well within the budget. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on to student services. Dr. Figueroa. Good evening, everyone. And let's see if I can. There we go. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to speak to you this evening about the proposed student services budget for the 2022-2023 school year. As you know, in student services, we promote student health and well-being, and we are tasked with supporting the whole child. Some of the areas that our budget encompasses in terms of health services, our nurse substitutes, our school physician, our therapeutic counseling services, which I'd like to speak to you a little more in depth in a few moments, our guidance and student assistance services, and of course our health and physical education curriculum. He's now, got his mask off. If you take a look at this, uh, our pie, our student services pie chart, under guidance services, you would have our archiving records. Uh, you would also have our student assistance specialist materials and our guidance uh, services as far as the uh, supplies and whatnot for our school guidance counselors. Under general administration, that would be our copiers, our materials there, and our office supplies. The big part of our pie chart there you see is health services, and most of that is our work with effective school solutions. And this is something that the board uh, had a lot of foresight with prior to COVID. Effective school solutions helps us with our counseling services for our students, our families, and also for professional development for our staff. Now, it was the board a couple of years back that was able to support us so that when COVID did hit, we were able to handle mental health challenges in a, lot, a much, much better level. COVID has only intensified and increased the frequency of health -related, mental health-related challenges. So what I'd like to do show you what we're proposing for the 2022-2023 school year. At the high school, we presently have one clinician from Effective School Solutions. I'd like to increase that to two clinicians and increase the case, case, overall caseload to 30. At Churchill, we also have one clinician. I'd like to increase that clinician, those clinicians to two and also increase that caseload to 30. At Hammershold, we would like to stay with the one clinician we have there, and also the FLEX program have our one clinician there. Now by increasing the high school in Churchill to two clinicians, there's no need for that half-time clinician that is doing our professional development. That professional development is embedded in those schools. That also gives us the opportunity to keep students in district that may otherwise may have to go out of district for services. In addition to that, it, all, it, po it possibly allows us to bring back a student who is presently out of district that uh, can now come back and receive services here. So uh, that is what we are proposing uh, I want to take this opportunity on behalf of the student services, all of our student services workers here in this district, to thank the board for your constant support and understanding so that we can do the work that we have to do with our students and our families. Without you, we could not do anything near what we are doing. So thank you very much for your support, and I'll take any questions if you have. 
Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Becker. Um, Luke, could you just um, talk for a minute on the, the double asterisk phrase at the bottom? Mm -hmm. I feel like it's one of those charts in an eye exam. No. As I read the bottom line, it's, okay. it's really small. So, but the professional development embedded in buildings through additional clinicians, meaning that there's ongoing professional right. development support. That we don't have. It's not a, a formal PD day or workshop. No, it's ongoing based on what that school's needs are because the clinicians are built right into the school. So right now, we don't, we don't have it quite that way because we don't have enough staff for that. Okay, thank you. Any, any further professional development is always good. So uh, you anticipate 2022, 2023 three school years, the caseload will double. So what's the, your base for this? anticipation? Well, right now we have seen an increase in uh, DCP and P cases. We've seen uh, this throughout the district, DCP and P Division of uh, Child and Family Protective Services. We've also seen um, our risk assessments go up. So we are anticipating, based on the needs we see this year, that, this will con that the trend will continue. And we want to make sure that we have uh, enough clinicians to support our staff so that we can do this work and continue to help our students and our families. Okay, thank you. Which is so important, and you know, before you thank the board for their foresight, but to be honest with you, this, this is you and your team. You know, you've always put the, the mental health of our students in this district, you know, at a very high level. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're faring as well as we are in such a difficult um, situation because this is something, you know, COVID has, has, has given us a lot more to deal with for the staff, for the students, um, but this was something that you were very, very proactive about well before COVID hit. And I think, uh, you know, I for one, I'm very appreciative. I think uh, you've done a wonder um, and a great service to, uh, to people trying to get through this any way they can because the whole student, the mental health picture was always so important. Well, so, I thank you and the so board thank you. and the fine staff that we have in student services. Take a bow, but take a bow yourself, as I said, you know, the, the board, you. you know, we, we, what you bring to us and you've always brought to us, um, you know, the, the high value on, on uh, the mental health of our, uh, our stakeholders. So thank you. Thank you. Do we have, oh, are you raising your hand? Is that a pen or a pen? pen? Dr. Frigo, yes. question for you. Uh, you brought it up a couple of times in this and, and, and recognizing the escalation in need in mental health. And you and I have had some conversations mm -hmm. as well as this board over the last year and a half. Based on that, based on what you're seeing, based on some of the issues that we're seeing in the school, in some cases on an escalated level, do you think there's a need for a staff position to be created to oversee this in a very narrow and specific way, even on a temporary basis to deal with the COVID? Uh, after COVID, I guess AC, uh, uh, within the district for both students, teachers, staff, and perhaps even parents being included in that? Are we missing a position right now? Well, I wouldn't say that administrative position because we do work so closely with uh, my team, uh, Luis Sultana, uh, who you know, is wonderful, Danielle Blaylock, uh, Vanessa Amatoro right now is working with us in interim basis as the uh, school counseling supervisor. So we have some very good people that work very closely with the ESS administration. Um, this is really where the need is. I see the need as clinicians in the building, and I will be quite frank with you, the numbers that I see throughout the state, throughout the country, of students with issues from as early as K to four and five have increased significantly over the last two years. So I will most likely be coming to the board in the next few months with data um, showing you that there may seriously be a need in the years to come to have clinicians at the elementary level, which is something five years ago we would have thought would have never been the case. So, so you please keep us posted. The yes. reason why I asked you how you got this number is I'm kind of worried. This, two cl this, this estimation is not good enough. It's not may not enough to for our students need. Mm -hmm. So that's why please keep us. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your support. Yeah. 
Oh, thank you. I, I think it's worth mentioning as well. I mean, the administrative team had the foresight. This was a discussion before COVID about increasing the services for our students, which everyone believed in increasing mental health services within the school. I think it's a huge responsibility towards the community. But I think the X factor that came in with COVID is also that there's a decrease in available services outside of school. I mean, I know in speaking to families, people experienced a six to 10 month wait who had health insurance, who had the contacts to get children in for services that were paid for by their health insurance. And um, I know that they leaned on the school a great deal during that time. I was just speaking to someone who talked about having to get their daughter on a waiting list to get on the waiting list. Yeah. Um, to get psychological services that they were on top of and needing. So I think the crisis is twofold. I think that the student need has increased and outside services are maxed out. So I think this is so worthwhile and I agree, I think we're going to need at the elementary schools in the future. Well, Ms. Gloss, that's, that is why I started out by saying that it was the board. If we didn't prepare as we did mm -hmm. two, three years ago, we wouldn't be in the good place we are now. And many districts are struggling right now to find these kind of services. So that relationship that we built uh, has been very, very good for us, for our students, and for our families. So again, I have to thank you, all of you. And just also to thank you again for some uh, Zoom services that you're doing where you have the parent universities and different topics related to stress, related to uh, possible suicide. I mean, there's really you know, important topics that you're covering, and there's 50 or 60 different parents in those Zoom calls, and they have access to the folks that maybe they don't have access to outside. I think there is a lot of value to that, and we thank you for offering those different uh, programs. Well, that is one of the things Effective School Solutions has been able to bring to us as part of the package. Uh, there are four evenings. The next one is this coming Tuesday at 7 p.m., uh, for those of you who are, are uh, able to um, go online and, and, and watch that, it's a, a 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, and it is about suicide prevention. Um, so, you know, again, that's all part of, of this package that the board, you know, had that foresight to know how important that would be three years ago. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have a question? The mask in the back corner. He's got a medical exception. It's fine. So just to bring this, um, this segment to closure, just a couple of updates. Um, first of all, budget presentations. We have those going on over the next couple of board meetings. Uh, we received um, uh, information late last week uh, that the governor's budget address uh, will be moved to March 8th. Uh, which means state aid data will not be available to us until March 10th. And so that also pushes out the tentative budget adoption. We don't have a date yet from the Department of Education. Uh, once we have that, certainly we'll share that with the board. Public hearing is scheduled for May 5th and final budget adoption May 12th. Uh, I was going to say that, of course, since the state is going to delay getting the numbers by it was a week and a half. Of course, on the other end, they'll give us the time, of course, of course. <laughs> correct, to prepare because of their delay. We'll have extra time, right, right, Bird? Uh, I anticipate that to be the case. It'd be oh. rather difficult to go from a March <laughs> 10th <laughs> state aid uh, release date and have a tentative budget for March 17th. I just don't see it happening. I'm, I There's love your optimism. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have to be optimistic. So I know you'll be worth the wait. Tennessee, what do you got at the high school? All right, so it's very busy here tonight with all the budget stuff. We are in a little bit of a quieter period at the high school. So we're starting to look towards the graduation end of things and end of year events. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing happening. <laughs> Um, as Dr. Valeski had mentioned earlier, we had the uh, orchestra and choir concerts this past week and the week before. Uh, Naaman is happening this weekend. That's the Model UN conference at the high school. I believe it is seniors only, but I'm not positive on that. 
Uh, we have our student and faculty basketball game coming up on February 24th. That is a Relay for Life fundraiser, which is a, a donations organized by the National Honor Society towards the Cancer Foundation. So if you are, have students at the high school that are able to purchase you tickets, you should do so. They are only sold uh, beforehand at the high school. Uh, spring sports are starting up. We're getting ready for tryouts that first week of March. And this week, we've had homeroom Olympics going on. Um, we had talked a couple meetings ago about the door decorating competition, and that was very well received, lots of participation and fun designs. Um, I don't have any pictures this time, but we did events like uh, trivia, EBHS themed trivia, of course, uh, making homeroom flags, a rock, paper, scissors tournament, and reverse Pictionary. Um, and each of these events were to earn points, and the winning homeroom will be announced tomorrow and delivered a treat at the start of their day. Um, and we have a Penny Wars that's been ongoing this past week, and uh, this is run by Sources of Strength event, and it's uh, paired with a You Are Too Too Kind Day on February 22nd, 2022, because the date is the two all over. <laughs> um, you're the <laughs> The event that day is to wear a tutu or a tie and to uh, engage in acts of kindness and take pictures of your acts of kindness to send to elementary students who are also participating. And as part of the Penny Wars, the winning uh, grade at the high school, their grade level administrator will be wearing a tutu on next Tuesday. <laughs> They're all men, so that should be interesting. I, I have heard, overheard that the seniors are leading right now, so... Uh, Mr. Yanazo will be wearing a tutu, it seems. <laughs> That'll be pretty. <laughs> he has a young daughter. He may have one to borrow. <laughs> so since I'm going to help you on your report for one thing that I actually got to attend, speaking of the seniors, the Mr. EBHS. Would you? It, that totally slipped my mind. I was there, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a pageant, a male pageant held uh, for any student that wishes to join, and they run for the title of Mr. EBHS. It's partially voted on by donations uh, from the audience, and partially voted, or the final vote, comes down to three teachers. I believe it was Mr. Chochain, Ms. Powers, and Mr. Siegel, Mr. Siegel this year. Uh, and Matt Tell did win, so congratulations to him. And he is our Mr. EBHS for this year. He was Mr. EBHS, and I have to tell you, I felt a little bit old because Matt and then <laughs> the MCs were kids that I knew since preschool. <laughs> so it was actually, um, it was kind of exciting. But I have to say, you know, he went for, I, I thought maybe it was uh, the moms because one of his answers was uh, talking about rom-coms. And I'm laughing. He loved rom-coms. That was his guilty pleasure. And I'm thinking, he's going for the middle-aged woman. Right there. <laughs> but he won, so it worked. But all the, all the, the guys were great. Um, I was going to say, that did seem to be a key selling point at so the end yeah. there. Did, did you find out, did they have a total of how much money was raised that night? Uh, I don't know that, that yeah. Because so I think it goes to help the Frey Quas for the prom, correct? Yes, it is our senior class council runs that event. So it is uh, it was fun for our prom. We, we didn't have that when I was at the high school, so I was, I was living through you guys, but it was a lot of fun. So. Yeah, they haven't Excuse had it for me, the um, Mrs. Years. Lex, we, we have a very young attorney here who needed us to explain what a rom-com was. He's older than I am. He can't ask like that. No, he's, he's <laughs> obviously way younger. Rom he's just another rom a romantic comedy. Yeah. I just learned that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he, he was busy studying. Yeah, he was, yeah. I, that's right. <laughs> Yes, but he, but he mentioned ones like Meg like Ryan in the 90s. Okay, yeah. Our board so. meetings are like a rom-com. I told his sometimes. mom that's why he won. His parents did very well. They raised him well. They had him watching. So. Can I ask Nora a question? Of course. I'm, we're just all having Nora questions. How did the blood drive go today? There's such a shortage. Um, I believe they filled all the slots they were aiming for, and I can't remember the exact number, but it was a very large number. <laughs> um, I want to say it was 100. Possibly, but I'm, wow. I'm not positive on that. I could be very off. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, my daughter texted me. She said, I just gave blood. I'm so proud. I said, how do you feel? She said, my arm hurts. I said, you've, you've taken blood before. So. Thank you. I love hearing about the high school. So, okay. Since she's a tough act to follow, we're going to try, right? 
Uh, the Board of Education recognizes the value of public comment on educational issues and the importance of allowing members of the public to express themselves on school matters of community interest. To protect the privacy of all students and staff, concerns regarding individual students and staff members should generally be addressed by first meeting with the appropriate administrative staff. A participant is limited to three minutes duration to be kept by our board secretary. Is there anyone wishing to speak to the board this evening? The red shirt, sorry. If you could state your name and address for the record, please. Alexander Spielman, 6 Douglas Road, East Brunswick. Um, good evening, members of the board. I wanted to uh, speak about the decision that the governor had just made recently about what's going to happen on March 7th, which is going to uh, relay that ability of masking down to the localities versus the state. I know that, they, that the superintendent just mentioned that there will be optional at that point in time. And I wanted to applaud that ability for parents to be able to make that decision at that point in time. Um, I think it's about time that we eventually start moving into a sense of normality um, and not to live in fear as we have been living at this period of time. Um, I also feel that that is also very useful and helpful, especially for the young students out there who have not really seen what a traditional school year is like, especially for those who, have, who are in grades three and younger. Um, they never knew what a traditional uh, high school, um, kindergarten, first grade, or second grade uh, year was like. Everything was either virtual or was mass, so you weren't able to see uh, your teachers or your classmates' face, or they were behind a screen. On top of this, the, when they are at that age, uh, they do have a significant, uh, they're still growing up. And so they're still learning about uh, cues, such as body language and eye contact, which are sufficiently uh, diminished when you do not have the face being fully covered. Um, so I wanted to say thank you for at least making that optional. And hopefully, in the near future, we'll be able to move into this post-COVID world uh, with our heads held up high, knowing that we face this as a, as a town and as a community together and without fear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Miss Angela? Oh. For everyone else, state your name and uh, address. Hi, Angela Paglia, 41 Stratford Road, East Brunswick. Hi, everybody. Um, I am here on behalf of the East Brunswick High School Track and Field Booster Club and our student athletes. We have concern, of course, like everyone else, about the turf field and how it could interrupt our spring season and how that, um, what kind of um, issues we'll face with um, we found out well we found out that recently that our invitational has been canceled so that affects our students with scholarships and such so we just want to see what other events could potentially be canceled due to the restoration of the field or if that will in any way affect our season and that's um, just a concern that we wanted to bring up Thank you. Um, Do you want to address at the end, or we want to start right now? Can we well, talk at the end? That's up to you. I apologize. Yeah. Generally, yeah, for fine. those who don't know, usually the public portion, you come and speak to mm -hmm. us, and we listen, and it's not a back and forth. So that is fine. I always want to yeah. make sure, and I apologize for not saying that beforehand, that if we don't answer your questions on the spot, it's not because we're not listening. It's because it's not part of it. But if Dr. Valeski mm -hmm. would like to um, no. make at the a end. comment. At the end. Okay. At the end. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. My name is Shermaine Phillip, 5 Nottingham Drive, East Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, I must say I am very impressed with what happened here today. Congratulations and thank you for all that you do here. 
Um, I wanted to piggyback a little bit on um, Angela. Just have some concerns. We have no idea what's happening with the turf when, um, when work is be um, about to begin. Would it interrupt our season? I think we have so many questions, um, and I was just looking for some answers. We didn't know where to go. The coaches could not provide any information to us, and I thought maybe this would be a good place to get some information. I have a graduating senior who is on a scholarship route. We really want to get these kids um, running. Um, we heard what they did last week at sectionals. They brought home a championship, and we want to keep that going. So we want to appeal to the, to the board and the decision makers. Um, if the feel is going to be, if the feel is going to, um, if the work is going to take place and, and that would be interrupted, you know, hopefully there would be some provision for the kids in terms of training at the different facilities. I'm not sure what plans are in place, but we're hoping that there's some provisions in place. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a medical reason. Um, Office. My name is Joseph Schmidt, 26 Lois Avenue, and I have a medical reason not to wear a mask. I can't do lead paint removal anymore because of that. Uh, it's so I want to talk to you about, just in general, about mask information because professionally in construction, I've used masks and, under, and been trained in PPE, and also when I was in EMS, I used to volunteer on Highland Park First Aid Squad years ago uh, when I lived in Highland Park. They also, I got training in PPE and in mask usage also. Um, so basically, just some, there's a concept in PPE that PPE protects EMT and not the patient. That you contaminate all the PPE you put on, so you're not really, you, you, like if you're dealing with a patient and you're touching them with gloves, you, can you'll, you already touched the gloves and you took it out of the bag, so you got it all over it. In case of mask, you're breathing on the mask as you put it on. There's aspects of that you can't really prevent getting your germs on other people because that's just the way it is. It's, they're actually designed to protect you from other people. Also, um, in the sense of a, uh, called? So that's one aspect of the concept. Also, there's a, a lot of the mask actually does make a difference. I know when the originally, when Murphy made the, Governor Murphy made the executive order, I was thinking I'd look at it more because it didn't make any sense to me. The mask does seem to make, it makes a big difference what mask you wear. I know from construction, N95 is especially designed for specific uses. There's special lead paint removal masks that you have to wear to prevent the lead from coming in there. And PP is part of a system. It's not just putting a mask on. It's a really, it's because germs are everywhere. You get it on your hands, you get it on your feet. When I was actually in EMS training, the, uh, the instructor actually told us about a story. Oh, sorry, I have Tourette syndrome, so if I have facial tics that act up, sorry about that. Um, that actually, that they did when he was in training. He didn't do it us because it was during the, around the time that they had the anthrax scare. So if there was a powder on the sign-in sheet, people would scare people possibly. So he didn't want to have the whole issue. So he went and he put, he had, when he was in student, they had, they put the powder that's only made for black, that black light can see on the powder, that you can see with black light, uh, being in the sign-in sheet. In the middle of the class, he turned off, the, the instructor turned off the light, put on the black light, and they saw that people had touched from the sheet. There, they had powder everywhere, windows, somebody had in their nose, all over the desks, all over their clothes, all over the place. Um, just the concept is that you're learning about how to treat, deal with PPE, you can't really do, you can't really, uh, it, it's almost impossible to prevent it from getting places anything. When you deal with uh, someone who has a, in a hospital, right, there's a negative pressure room. If somebody goes and has actually a dangerous illness, a respiratory illness, they put them in the negative pressure room. Negative pressure room is, negative, pressure is negative relative to the rest of the hospital to prevent something from escaping into the rest of the hospital. And when they go and the actual, the nurses or the doctors go to see the patient, they wear a whole body hazmat type suit. And that's actually the way to get pr the real protection from an actual pathogen of some kind. Um, and there's other aspects too. For example, if there's not a good seal, which most masks don't have a good seal, then it will actually go out the sides of the mask. And even then, when you breathe out, the actual ear has to go somewhere. It doesn't just disappear. So the hope is that people say it filters it. Ten seconds. All right, thank you. Um, but it doesn't, if the holes are too big, it's not going to filter the little aerosols and it's going to go out or go out the side. And then you have like a shower, like a shower head. It makes the pressure more to actually go farther. All right. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Is there anyone else this evening wishing to speak to the board? Okay. Seeing none, I will close the public portion. Um, oh, I apologize. Yes, and I will let you... You can be the and I'm, I'm going to ask Mr. Giuliano to weigh in with me. So I apologize to the track athletes that, and, and the booster parents that you may not have gotten the information. Obviously, you know 
that we're in the process of replacing the, the field turf and all of the track surfaces as well. It's one project and it's gonna involve a lot of labor and, and milling of the track surface to replace it. Um, I'm just gonna be completely honest. The season at East Brunswick is just not likely to happen. We, we have reached out, we are exploring with other school districts to be able to provide our athletes with premium facilities to practice on, to compete on, just as we did with our, our football team. Um, we understand the impact this is having. We understand the impact to our athletes, especially our senior athletes. But unfortunately, we are in this dilemma that in order to provide our community, our school with this premium facility that we intend to deliver for next season, there, there is gonna be an interruption. Uh, but we are doing our best to work with other districts to make sure that facilities are available, that we have everything organized and coordinated and we want to see our athletes perform it at an optimum level. So that's, that's our commitment to, to them. Mr. Giuliano, do you want to talk about the mechanics of anything or? We don't have a precise schedule to share at this time because we don't have that schedule. We're waiting on the contractor to provide that to us. Um, that of course is going to be uh, driven by availability of materials. Um, and so once we have uh, more finite information, we'll be able to share that out. Uh, but the information that we have right now is we know that the contract has been awarded. Uh, the work will take place. We just don't know what that time frame is. And as soon as we have it, as I said, we'll be sharing that. Thank you. I'm going to ask for a motion to move the agenda, the rest of the agenda this evening. Before I do, is there anything anyone needs separated out? No? Then seeing none, I'm going to ask Someone. for a second. Mrs. Becker, Mr. Winston, is there any discussion on any items on this evening's agenda? I just have one quick question. Um, the overnight field check for the EBHS International Studies, is that something new? I'm so used to our Model UN, no. but I don't remember no. seeing that. No, no it's Have you seen that before? Mm -hmm. Oh, all right, look at that. Okay. Will the secretary please call the roll? Mrs. Becker? Yes. Mr. Carangelo? Yes. Mrs. Chu? Yes. Mr. Sismar? Yes. Mrs. Gloss? Yes. Mr. Hong? Yes, but uh, abstain from the board, the location item number one. Noted. Thank you. Mrs. Reese? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. President Lax? Yes. Okay. Okay. Bringing us to new and old and or old business committee reports, information items for the good of the cause for the board. Mrs. Becker. I would like to give a shout out to somebody in our audience tonight under for the good of the cause of the board. We know uh, Dana Zambicki as a uh, former very well-respected veteran teacher uh, and now for many years as the head of our union. And now our town is going to benefit from wisdom as she was just appointed to fill a vacancy on the town council. So I wanted to say congratulations, Council Zambicki, Councilwoman Zambicki. That was my good of the cause. <laughs> That's pretty good. And that was a good one. <laughs> no one else? No one? Okay, well then just me. Then I'm just going to say, because as I mentioned with Nora, I had a pretty good East Brunswick week. So being a lifer, um, the reason I love this town, things like that, things like um, the Lunar New Year celebration. Lee Wu was kind enough to buy some of us these lovely lucky tigers. And I truly believed it was going to be the Bengals year because of that. It was not. Yes. Um, but it was a really a nice, um, it was a beautiful day. I enjoyed uh, spending time there. Um, and then I also have to give a shout out for someone sitting on the dais. Oh, look, they both look up. Um, so, you know, you talk about how we're a community. And Dr. Figueroa came to see, and it's funny, I'm waiting to see because I didn't look at my phone. Um, the East Brunswick Fast Break uh, boys played a game tonight at the high school. But last weekend, um, 
Dr. Figaro came to the game to watch the kids, brought his kids, and I just thought that was so nice because it really did make it feel like a community. So I thank you for that. I just think this is what makes us such a special place. So that's my favorite the cause. Um, okay. We do have a need for closed session. So whereas the Board of Education must discuss matters which are not appropriate for discussion at a public meeting, and these subjects are with the exceptions to the Open Public Meetings Act, and whereas the Board of Education intends to discuss matters as follows, those items listed in tonight's agenda, um, the length of the closed session is estimated to be one hour, after which the public meeting of the board shall reconvene and action may be taken. <clears throat> Can I please have a motion to go into closed Second. session? Second. 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 Motion by Mrs. Becker, second by Mr. Carangelo. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we are in closed session. Thank you and good night.